A Qt app deserves a clean architecture. I see quite many faces here. This means probably that not all of you are completely happy with their application architecture. Raise your hands if you're not completely happy. Ah. Everyone else who's happy can go out, then there is no need to, <laughs> to watch this presentation. So I'm not gonna, certainly not gonna give you definite answers, but I hope I can give you some pointers and elicit a bit of discussion because it's a kind of theme which is very central to software development, um, but it's not really much spoken about or is spoken about in separate contests, separate conferences, and uh, probably people who start out with Qt would like to know how can I implement some ideas that I've seen, that I've heard of in, with Qt and in Qt. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Right. So, we, we have this, this metaphor of architecture, which means uh, having bricks, doors, and windows, and using them to build our house like the three little pigs, right? We want our house to be solid as the, the third pig, but of course, it's not just that. Software is a bit different. We also want it to be flexible and uh, modifiable without uh, um, having to rewrite everything from scratch every time, right? So Qt provides us with the bricks, the doors, and the windows, no? We have to create um, the rooms of our house. And those rooms can be large, big, they can be connected in many ways, and we don't know when we begin our project. What you do with what Qt gives to you is your problem, no? Is what you have to do as an application developer. And it is a good thing to have freedom because many other frameworks uh, are more at the architecture level. They tell you MVC, everything should be MVC, model view controller, and you, you have to stick to that, okay? Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not. So you need a blueprint for your house. Is it too strong? Okay, thank you. Otherwise you end up with something like this, no? Your final architecture will look like, <laughs> like that not really a nice house to live in, right? So, what are the rooms that I need for my house? How do they connect to each other? And there is not much literature about how to do that in Qt. Uh, there are a couple of interesting examples. This first article is uh, from David Johnson from ICS, and uh, it's a good starting point. At least it tells you uh, you've got your QML layer, UI layer, and then you've got uh, adapters where you expose your models uh, as key object instances, uh, the things that we already know. Uh, um, and then you've got your business logic underneath. Another interesting model is the Flux model, which me, some of you may know from the React world. It comes from Facebook. It's, pretty, it's a pretty nice model in, in in the, in the um, fact that it uh, forces you to have a, a unique data flow, so a, a unique direction for your data, okay? Um, you can look into that if you're interested. There is also a very nice QML implementation of Flux made by this guy from Hong Kong, Ben Lau. So please look into that as well. What is a clean architecture? The clean architecture is a... Um, it's a general term, but it's also a kind of specific way of structuring things. And um, it has been suggested by Robert C. Martin, that is also known as Uncle Bob, is a very popular figure in, in software architecture circles. Um, and it builds upon ideas uh, from other um, um, developers as well. What, what are the, the main cores of this kind of, of architecture? And your business entities, your business objects should be the core of your application. And you should build everything around those. 
because those are what matters most. Everything else is a detail. The user interface is a detail. Uh, the DB is a detail. Everything which, which uh, is technology is a detail, okay? Around your user, your entities, your business objects, you've got your use cases. Use cases are nothing else than other than interactions between entities, okay? You've got your user, you've got your cash machine, and an interaction, a use case is an interaction, for example, between the user and the cash machine, okay? Then you've got gateways, controllers, and presenters, which are just an interface layer with the outer world. Okay, the nice thing about, our, uh, uh, about this approach is that it is in independent of frameworks. It is testable because you've got very clear and well-defined layers. It is independent of the UI because you should be able to test your entities and your use cases without having to touch your UI, for example. That's a completely separate concern, okay? Independent of the database, because that will also be encapsulated, and independent of any other kind of external agency. Now, this is all very abstract, and I want to show you what this means for the Qt world. Uh, I took some concepts from this uh, approach and I tried to implement this, those in, with the tools that Qt provides you with. So, what are my application layers usually? I've got the use cases, I've got the entities, and I've got repositories. So what use cases are, I already told you. They are interactions between entities. The entities are your business objects, your models, if you will, but also encapsulate your core business logic specific to a, an entity, like a user, for example. The repositories, they just abstract and encapsulate data input and output and any other external agency, okay? Use cases can be modeled with behavior-driven development. You might have already heard about that. Raise your hand if you have, please. Okay, not so many. Uh, basically, it's a way of looking at uh, features in software and in other contexts that s start from scenarios. So I have a, a high-level feature. For example, this is a simple application where I want to see what's left in my fridge no? before I starve. So uh, the feature says, check available groceries. And then I've got different scenarios. One scenario is when, when one or or more groceries are actually available in my fridge, okay? And I describe that scenario in terms of prerequisites, actions of my system, and outcomes that I want to achieve. Given that a list of available grocery items is empty, and I actually know that I do have something in the fridge, when I check the available grocery items, I, then I should be given a list of available grocery items and those should be ordered by type, so they can look at them alphabetically. Is this clear enough, this feature? So this kind of description has got a very good feature, that it can be understood also by non-technical people, no? Because it is plain English text, right? You can reason about this with business people. You've got preconditions, the givens, actions, the whens, and expected results, the thens. This kind of stuff you could and should already model in your code directly, okay? This is an implementation with Qt test, where for each step you um, try to verify that the step is actually met, okay? The given step, for example, I've got a ten an entity which represents my grocery items, and I want to check that at the beginning this uh, list of items is empty, okay? If it's not, there is no reason for me to go on with my use case, I just have to stop there and ensure that this precondition is met, okay? And then I checked another precondition, for example, in, in, in this case, that one or more grocery items are actually available somewhere in my fridge. This is a, a, a ground truth, so it's, it's true that I have something in my fridge. 
It's not true in my, in my application yet, but I must model this precondition in some, in some way. Then I have, when I check my available groceries, that's when I run my use case. So what I want to do as a user is check the available groceries, okay? So I will have a use case object, which is called use cases check available groceries, which to, whom, to, whom, to which I pass my entity, which is the grocery items list. And in this case, I use a signal spy to verify that my use case completed correctly. And I look at the success signal, okay? Once I have performed my use case, for example, the user clicks check available groceries or the open apps with this, the app opens with this uh, action, then I compare what the results, okay? What is the outcome of this action? The outcome is that, that now my list is not more, not empty anymore, and it's got the same number of items that I actually have in my fridge, or that I know should be in my web service or database or wherever, no? And then I also verify that the list is actually sorted, okay? This is all done programmatically. I can run automatic tests, and I'm sure that for the important things, my application will run and perform those things and will be behave correctly, okay? I can show to my customer that the application does what it promises, okay? Because we started from the, use, from the feature specification and we implemented that. Okay, one of the benefits of writing the tests first is that you have to reason about your API before implementing it, okay? You have to uh, define what are the methods that you can call from the outside, what are the return types of, of your functions, and all this kind of stuff. Then there are some technicalities here, like the fact that you can pass the entity to the use case as a reference or as a pointer, uh, or you can have a global registry where you have your, all your entities registered when you start up your application. And uh, the last aspect is that, uh, how do you actually fetch the data to do this kind of stuff? You can have real fetchers for, for your data from database, for example, but you could also use mock repositories, where you mock the data that you're bringing into your application and you're working on that data. If you use that kind of strategy, you can run your tests very fast without having to access the database, the internet, which is always a mess. When you, when you develop your application, okay? Then, this is the implementation of my use case. I have a run method, and I connect certain things that happen after this run with a success or with a, with a, with a failure, okay? So, um, let me use the pointer, okay. So, in my run method, what I go to my grocery items, which is my entity, and I say retrieve all the data that you, that you can. And when this is done, then I will do something else in my use case. What I do, it is either to emit a success or a failure message. I could do other things before emitting the success or the failure, but for now, here, I, ju I just only have one action. Okay, then how do I model my entities? I can have them already given by my system, by my company, or I can come up with them once I reason about my use case, because I see, aha, uh -huh, to implement this use case, I need a, a list of grocery items. So that will be one of my entities. And so on, I can keep on modeling my, my data. Then, I, I told you I can abstract my database calls, my web uh, calls, thanks to repositories. So what I'm doing here is the grocery items entities receives a command from the use case, retrieve all, retrieve all the data that you, that you have available. And to do that, I use a repository, okay? In this repository, I say retrieve all records. 
I don't care what the, this repository does or, or how it is implemented. It could be an SQL, it could be a web service, I don't care as a, at the entity level. I just tell, give me my data, and then I will process the result. Once I get the data, I can empty my list, I can append the new records, I can sort them as we, we checked before, and then I tell to my use case, everything is done. Okay, you can move on. Repositories have this uh, role of encapsulating storage, input and output. Okay, uh, so in this way I can encapsulate technology, leave it outside of my logic and of my system, and just use it whenever it's needed. And my test cases, as I already told you, run faster, because I don't need to access the database or the web, I just use mock components for that. And I can switch between them. For example, this is a, a dummy a repository where I just return some records, okay? It is a Q-variant list, I just create some demo records and I return them to the, my entity so that I, I can use them in my application. Then once this is done, I can think about my user interface. It could be a graphical user interface, it could be a textual, a common line interface. I can, I can swap between them without having uh, any issue, just because all my logic is isolated into these deeper layers. Okay, this is a very simple implementation of a command line interface for this use case. I just create my grocery items entity, then I create my repository, my use case, and uh, do all the uh, piping and wiring. Then I care about the text output. So. I do a key object connection. Uh, when my use case returns with a success signal, then take the message of the success signal and print it in my, in my output, okay? And then take the list of the results and print all the records of the list. This is the input of the, my command line interface. I just parse this action, which, is I rep which I represented as a string, check available grocery items. So when you encounter that string, run the use case. Check available grocery items, groceries, run, and, and then exit with a, success, uh, with a success message, okay? If any other input is typed, then uh, action not support and exit. Okay. This is done in C++. Of course, you could do the very same things in QML, and it doesn't matter. Many times you hear as a Qt programmer, QML for your UI, C++ for your logic, that doesn't help you much. In, in fact, QML sometimes is a useful language as a glue language to put components together. Um, so the language doesn't really matter. What matters is the structure that you give to your application. And if you keep your layers cleanly separated, you can mix and match between QML and C++ components. At first, this kind of thinking is a bit tedious. It requires you to generate a bit of code, but if you use it regularly, you could even use code generators for uh, your boilerplate code, and that works well. Uh, you might even want to add more application layers, like a presentation layer between your entities and your user interfaces. Uh, if you want to manipulate your data, okay? And finally, I went through a few iterations of this and uh, it's still an ongoing process and I, I would like to know if anybody of you has got similar ex experiences or tried something out which worked well for them. Because for me, for example, this, you, following this kind of approach, just it made me think and change completely the kind of certainty that I have when I deliver an application that it performs as expected. Because it's an outside-in approach, I start from the outside, I say, this test of my use cases should pass, 
And then from there, I can say, does it pass or does it, doesn't it pass? And I can show my customer that the application does what it's meant to do. Nothing more, nothing less. So this is a bit of references, if you want to know more. There is new book, this new book, uh, the second item, which just came out in September, and uh, it will certainly be an entertaining read as all books by Uncle Bob. The first one is a shorter blog post from 2012. Code examples, I do already have online a QML-based code example about this kind of architecture, and I will also post the C++ one so that you can see that what really matters is not the language, but the entities and components that you come, out, you come up with in your application. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marco. Any questions? All right. Okay. So, really nice topic. I started something similar about two years ago as a proof of concept. Yeah, the and command query approach. Exactly. Yes, I saw that. Uh, OK. So how we ended up that, it, we created the proof of concept. And our, conc our conclusion was that we ended up writing too much boilerplate code. Yes. Uh, you also mentioned the code generators. How, how did you find that scaling on a larger application? Well, I'm, I'm currently still, I, I just used it for fairly, fairly small projects, uh, which means that doing everything manually is still uh, uh, a good option. I really do think that if you scale it up a bit, you should have uh, IDLs or for code generation and that kind of stuff. But that's a little effort. Once that you have uh, done it, uh, it's done. No? So I don't see much of an issue there. Um, I think that the benefits of an approach like that really outweigh the, um, the effort. You might have had another, a different experience. So and so, yeah. But probably the main benefit is having a test-driven approach. That's the, uh, yeah. There's a question here. <laughs> uh, great talk. I uh, really like that you use test-driven development. Um, have you tried Catch? I haven't. Uh, I was also in the talks with another guy yesterday evening. Uh, uh, that would be nice because Catch gives you given then and uh, given when then instructions. I, I, I'm, I stick with Qt Test for the moment because I like uh, listening to to signals, all these kind of the cute specific machinery that you get from that, comparing strings and this kind of stuff. But of course, that's a very good alternative. And actually, there was at, contribute, at the contributors day on Monday, there was a session on testing. And a couple of people suggested to look into other frameworks, even for Qt, for testing Qt, like Catch. So that, that gives you a BDD approach almost for free, so to say, and you could have some helper functions uh, that are Qt specific that you could uh, put into there. Yeah. So yes. Any last questions? All right, thank you, Marco. Okay, thank you. <laughs>